Hi, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, and it's especially nice to see some non-MFA photo people who have joined us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adam Bell and I'm the academic advisor and faculty member in the MFA photo department. And we are very excited to have Lev Nanovich here to give a talk. And as a bit of history, I'm especially excited because I remember when I was a student not too long ago, or actually maybe a little bit long ago, back starting in my first year in 2001, I remember buying and reading Lev Manovich's uh, famous book, uh, The Language of New Media, and being amazed by it and thinking it was this brilliant book. So it's really great to have him here now. Um, for those of you who don't know a little bit about Lev, I'm going to do a sort of abbreviated bio, which I've taken from his uh, website, uh, which I'll just go through quickly here. Uh, Lev Manovich is an artist, computer animator, designer, and programmer, as well as an author of numerous books, including his most recent, which is Software Takes Command, Soft Cinema, Navigating the Database, and The Language of New Media. He is currently a professor at the Graduate Center of CUNY and the director of the Software Studies Initiative that works on the analysis and visualization of big cultural data. In 2013, he appeared on the list of 25 people shaping the future of design. And in 2004, he was included in the list of the 50 most interesting people building the future. Uh, in addition to being a former Guggenheim Fellow, he has also received grants from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, for those of you who want a closer look at some of his work, I would encourage you to check out his website, which I'm sure he's going to show today, uh, which he's worked on, uh, called On Broadway. And also to check out the Public Eye uh, Photography Show at the New York Public Library, which is up now, and I think does it run until next March? Until January. Okay. Which is a fabulous show and I highly encourage you to check it out. So it is a great honor to have Lev here and uh, this will be a fantastic lecture. Well, thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you guys so much for organizing this. And uh, uh, we hope that maybe not going be my last engagement, you know, we're talking maybe about doing some workshop with some students. So hopefully you still like me after this first date. Now I know you got some students who were, were actually required to come here, so please don't hate me after this. Okay? And if you hate me, I'll buy you beer. Um, so today I'll be talking and actually showing you uh, a range of projects we have done in our lab, uh, which trying to look at massive image collections using techniques of data visualization and also computer vision. Uh, and I'm specifically going to focus on the projects where we look at photography uh, via Instagram. But before I show these projects, you know, I want to make a kind of more general statement. So, you know, I think last year, you know, President Obama right, said that to be literate in our society, you have to know how to program. I mean, now I'm sure you have other, you know, people you maybe admire more or respect more, but you know, when the president of uh, you know United States says everybody has the program, I mean, I was very happy to hear that because those of us who have been involved in digital art, and I've, I've been involved for about 30 years, of course, we're dreaming about the moment where people will actually say, hey, it's not enough for me to know how to you know, press a you know, button on my Leica or you know uh, make a PowerPoint. I should also know something about the code because the code is to a modern society is what I would say electric engine, uh, you know, the, the trains uh, and other kind of technological forces were to industrial society, right? Everything runs on code. Well, we know that. Even President Obama knows that, right? So that's not a big news. But what you guys may not have realized is that, in fact, if you think about visual culture, right, in the history of media, it's 19th century, you know, we've got photography, we've got Fox, we got television invented in 1870, and then, of course, all these things become really big in the 20th century. You know, radio, again, television, video, internet, and so on. Right? But I think that maybe five to ten years ago, in fact, our society has entered a new stage. Or well, let's say our media culture have entered a new stage. And amazingly, nobody has written about it yet, as far as I know. So I don't have a name for it, but maybe we can call it something like computational media or even cultural analytics. So basically, 
a significant number right, of cultural interfaces right, that the companies put up for us to interact with culture depend on computational analysis of massive amounts of media. Right? So while I'll be using some of the same techniques as a way to do a kind of art history or archaeological present, right, I think you want to be curious and I think you want to learn about these techniques just because you know, if you want to be a literate photographer, right, or a literate artist in 2015, you should know how mass visual culture works. You should know how culture industry works. And I'm telling you, not all of it, but to a significant extent, it works on, not just on code, right, not just on, you know, MySQL, you know, Python, and so on. It works on the particular techniques of analyzing massive amounts of media. I mean, think about Google search. I mean, how does Google search work? Well, Google sends robots. You know, we go online, we travel from one web page to another web page, with maybe about 14 to 15 billion web pages today, according to best estimates. It extracts all the content, right, from every web page. It analyzes all this content, right? Whatever it is, you know, breaks it down. If it's images, it's also images, puts it in database indexes, and then when you search for something, it's going to, it will return pages which you think are most relevant, or in the case of images or video, it will be images of video. So search, which is now our interface to information, as opposed to, let's say, library catalog, uh, depends on massive processing of cultural content, such as web pages and other stuff online. Right? Recommendations, right? So if I go to Amazon or Netflix, you know, they're going to recommend me some movies to see, or some books to buy, or, you know, uh, baby diapers, or maybe some super expensive lens for my camera, whatever, right? But how does Amazon know what I like? Well, it looks at what I'm looking at, it looks at what I'm buying, it compares me to the same buying histories of billions of billions of our user sessions, and then, again, that's calculation. So in this case, the calculations are done not on the actual media, such as photograph of the pages, but the calculations are done on my cultural preferences, right, my buying history. Uh, we go to maybe one of the more popular kind of newer news website, such as you know, Meshable.com. So I was talking to a guy who is very chief data scientist, right? and he says that so we build an algorithm, right, which basically recommends the journalist every morning what we should write about, you know, based on processing you know, billions of numbers, you know, what people looked at before, what people looked at last year. But I think what's even more amazingly, like when he, when he told this, I was just totally shocked. So we have an algorithm, which is, uh, in real time, adjusts the position of articles on the page. So it analyzes the data, right, of people kind of visiting its website, you know, using some old data, uh, and it basically uses this to automatically adjust position of images. Okay? So, right, I mean, like you look at this, it looks very innocent. But in a, it's a kind of right, it's like an alien from a new era, except a new era we're really living in. So those of you who are obsessing about becoming a famous photographer because you're going to take this one amazing photograph, I'm not against it, right? But you have to be really genius, right? You know, because so many great people took so many great photographs. But if you want to get into algorithms and code and affect processing of visual information and thinking about massive image collections, and then combine it with artistic ideas, intellectual ideas, maybe UI for photography, you can do some really bad project and become famous because this is completely new, right? So at this point, the industry is like decades away, right? While it's kind of clicking and looking at single images, the industry is processing billions of images, billions of data points to create these crafted experiences for us. So how can we take these techniques and actually use them more humanistically to do some interesting things, to do art, and maybe to also understand patterns in history of photography? So I'm going to start with uh, a recent project we have done. It uh, was an invitation from MoMA, right, Museum of Modern Art. We've been working for a few years on a big, big project, which is now exhibited, called Modern Photograph from Thomas Walter Collection. It is an amazing exhibition, so go see it. If you can afford $25, but you can get artist membership, actually. You can do lots of time for free. And as a part of this uh, exhibit, you know, we commissioned people to write essays. So we invited my lab uh, to look at the photographs of this collection and see if we can use computational and visualization techniques you know, to maybe say something interesting. Well, uh, so I said one of my students, you know, he was a research fellow 
last summer 2013, you know, he was really nice to them. And after a while, they gave him the whole digitized photo collection of MoMA. So I don't know if it's all, or, or, or we think it's all, nobody knows, but 21,000 photographs. Okay. So how does, you know, how does 21 photographs you know, from MoMA look, look like? I'll show you. So we kind of, this is a you know, 70 page or you know, PowerPoint, we presented to them our findings, and eventually we asked them to reduce it to 10 pages. So you can look at the essay online, but I'm just showing all the stuff. You know, it didn't make it to a print, and we also had a signed agreement that we're not allowed to show it to anybody or publish it. So, so but, but here it is. But you guys don't tell them, right? Uh, anyway, so uh, so just one, one more second, please. Okay, here we go. Yeah, this is a big one. Okay, so this is one of many visualizations we have done. So what it is? It's with 21,000 photographs from our collection simply organized by year. And of course it reveals something we may suspect that MoMA collection, right, you know, because for, for decades MoMA was the first museum to collect photography, right? So they, you know, MoMA was very important in making that photography part of our art and our history. Uh, you know, but you may kind of expect that maybe very, very strong in a kind of between war avant-garde, but it's really, really strong, right? So basically, this is you know, in the 19th century, we have something, and then between let's say, 1920 and 1940, look at how huge were collection. And then there's very little from the 50s, and then there's a little bit more maybe you know, in the 60s and 70s, and then you know, there's almost nothing after that, right? So now you can, you can see why museums don't publish visualization of their websites, because then everybody knows how kind of particular their collections are. Uh, but uh, the reason I'm showing it is the first thing Yes, of course, you can present the same information as a bar plot, but then it looks very abstract, right? So in our lab, we develop you know, simple software, you know, it's open source software, you know, we've been giving it away for free since 2010, where you can actually make these visualizations yourself. So the idea is to create visualizations of image collection, you know, which would not just show you patterns in a collection using points, you know, bars, rectangles, and so on, right? All this kind of data visualization porn, Sometimes people call it, but in fact, make visualization out of actual images in the collection, right? So if I start zooming in, you know, as long as the computer can keep up with me, uh, eventually I'm going to actually see you know, the actual images because the visualization is made from them. Even, of course, you know, these bars now become very, very meaningful, right? Because, of course, what you see is that these images, which really can dominate, right, MoMA collection, it's not just any particular images, but the images of very particular modernist avant garde photography, right? Very abstract. You know, black and white, uh, you know, some kind of fragmented body parts, right? Lots of defamiliarization, uh, maybe you know this concept of Australian defamiliarization, and so on and so forth, right? So, in fact, you know, the collection is really dominated by a very particular type of photography. So, it in no way represents the history of photography as it actually happened, right? It doesn't really represent the natural photography, right? So, in this case, the relation control it. Now, uh, as you have just got the, as you just saw, right? Once you start creating these visualizations, where you actually want to show you know, massive image collections on one screen, you know things like laptops or, I mean, or these awful, awful devices, right? With your mobile phones, they're basically awful, right? Because they prevent you from thinking, right? So the last 15 years was a kind of waste, in a certain sense, in terms of like artistic uh, digital imagination, because everybody trying to make these little apps, right? And this is like Atari, right, of 1970. And you know, if I only would stare at this awful device, I would never think about, let's visualize whole MoMA collection. So I was very lucky, but until I came to New York, uh, you know, where you wouldn't even find a space to put this wall. Well, maybe you guys can find a space. I also practiced some art, digital art for 20 years. And I got involved with a research institute called California Institute for Telecommunication Information, where people are basically de you know, devising the information st structures you know, for the next generation. So we're devising next generation internet, next generation computing, you know, where you know, CPU will be here, and then you know, maybe graphics card will be in Taiwan, you know, and the screen will be like in Mexico, right? So the computer is distributed. Uh, the internet, which is not using like normal cables, it's using optical fibers, so it's super fast. And we're also designing next generation displays, right? Because we're saying correctly, well, if the world is connected, right? If we're all talking to each other, if we're all uploading everything, you know, liking Instagram photos, right? I mean, we're producing massive, amount, massive amounts of cultural content and cultural communication, 
So this device is totally idiotic, right? You basically look at the world for a little keyhole, right? And yes, it's amazing in one way. The communication device is amazing as a device to think about art, right? It's like, okay. I wouldn't break it, but I just hold it. You know? But maybe, maybe like if you invite me to lecture again, like before my contract, I'll just kind of break it. Okay. So, uh, so these devices are much better, right? <laughs> so this is a kind of visualization wall. So I was lucky to work with at the University of California, San Diego. This is you know, one of many we built. So this particular wall cons you know, consists from dozens of kind of uh, large uh, 46 monitors. So it's like, and then a bunch of PCs of high-end graphics card, you know, the kind of things you use to play video games. Behind it, so it's a little visual supercomputer. So I can load you know, a big image collection, and you'll see the second sorted. And basically do exploration, right? Uh, so the kind of things, you know, maybe photographers or photo editors in <laughs> magazines like Life or Vogue, right? Uh, or whatever, was doing for decades, right? Where you, you put your photographs on the wall, and you decide, you know, like which photo shoot is going to go where, what's editorial, what you're going to select. So, you know, this is in fact a very, I think, common practice in the kind of photo journalism community. But what if you can do it with computer, and what if you can actually do it with billions of images? So let me show you a little video which we shot when we kind of spent a few months and developed a little software for this wall. It's kind of old, it's 2009, uh, but it communicates by idea. We're here at the hyperspace wall at Cal IT2, and we've loaded an image set of the works of painter Mark Rothko. Using software developed by the Software Studies Initiative and the hyperspace wall team, we're going to be exploring this um, set of paintings using cultural analytic techniques, turning the paintings into sets of data that can be graphed and turning those graphs into collections of paintings. First, let's take these images and let's move them over onto part of the wall's surface and then load some graphs on the other part of the surface. These graphs all run over the years of Mark uh, Rothko's career from left to right, but their heights are indicated by um, different features of the images themselves. Texture, brightness, number of shapes, saturation, and we can use them to explore trends in this painter's life and work. So let's organize this tile set that we have by one of these dimensions of data. We can sort through different axes um, looking at something as simple as just the sequence of files, which we can view at different sizes, um, all the way down to a series of dots. Um, and we can size all the way up to high-resolution textural images. I'm going to turn the size on this down slightly, and then I'm going to add a transparency effect you can actually see the original dot data in the midst of the color cloud and by mousing over any individual painting you can pick it out of the space of color trends over the course of Rothko's career. I'm going to turn the transparency feature off now and then size these images back down to a normal set. Now we can see the individual paintings no longer overlapping. Let's look at another axis. Um, we can cycle through all of these various axes that, and uh, perhaps arrive at one that has a particular shape or, a, um, or has um, an image like this one right here. We can see that uh, um, if we size that particular image up that's standing out from the graph and uh, choose to look at it, we can see um, that this one particular painting is uh, quite unusual in Rothko's um, career for one or another low-level statistical reasons. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to do all of art history or all of uh, visual analytics based on um, low-level mathematical statistics. But it does mean that the graph becomes an occasion to pick out an image and say, oh, this breaks the pattern, or this is typical of the pattern, why? What's so particular about this image? The important thing about this software is that it allows me to explore um, transparent views. It allows me to um, look impressionistically at the way the data explodes into more complexity 
at one side of the screen and focuses off on the other. Let's go back to a tile view of uh, looking at all of these images again. Okay. Um, so you got the idea. Uh, so basically we wanted to build the tools which would allow us to explore patterns of an image and video collections of any size. And we thought, well, you know, why don't we you know, use computers to extract various characteristics from images, you know, brightness, color, you know, RGB parameters, texture, and then create another software tool which would allow us to basically sort this collection in real time by any of these characteristics. Okay? So I'll show you next, you know, some projects we've done more recently you know, where we use these techniques. Uh, but before that, I, I kind of want to also demo for you, let's see, one of the recently emerged you know, companies, there is now a few companies which actually offer you know, computer vision for the masses. And when people normally think about computer vision, you know, digital image analysis, or mach machine vision, all this term kind of means the same thing, they say, Lev, so what are you guys doing? You're probably guys doing like face recognition, or maybe you automatically can recognize the subject in photographs. Well, in fact, we're not really doing it that much. Uh, because uh, the computer vision has, you know, developed since late 50s. In fact, the basic techniques were really developed in the 1960s, but it only became possible to process in millions of images very quickly in the last you know, five, 10 years. Um, and if you have an image, right, and you want to measure, let's say, average brightness value, you can do it for every image, right? You just look at every pixel and divide the number by number of pixels. So when you take a photo, right, and you guys all have like these really soft up cameras, right, and the camera shows a histogram, right? So the computer is basically doing the same analysis. It analyzes pixel values in the image, even shows you a graph, a kind of visualization, right, of uh, pixel values. So you can do this, you can use these techniques for every image. But if you want to do, if you want to ask computer to do more, what's called high level analysis, try to recognize faces, maybe, maybe age in the photo, gender, that still works pretty okay. But if you want to ask a computer to maybe recognize the type of scene, the type of object represented, it's getting better, but it's not that amazing. So I will show you also one of the projects where we're using, for example, computer vision analysis from the same company, and it worked really well. And I think in this year, maybe we can try to experiment with scene analysis. Uh, you know, but it's very, very uneven, right? So if you want to find, let's say, passenger cars in the photo, maybe it works with 90% accuracy. If you want to find red flags, maybe it'll be 30%. But the field is developing, so perhaps in a few years, you know, it would work quite well. And obviously, things like face recognition are built anywhere, right? By building all the, kinds, all the photo cameras, you know, from iPhone, right, up to the most expensive, you know, Nikon. I mean, right, things like Facebook also recognize faces. So face recognition works pretty well, right? But let's actually see how, you know, what, what kind of things the computer can extract. So by the way, if you want to, if you want to use this company, I mean, it's just one of them. I mean, I'm, I'm not like paid for them, but I'm showing it to you because it's the same company we used uh, to do one of our projects, Selfie City. Uh, so most of them give you basically ability to do some free processing, right, without paying if it's more number of images. And uh, oh, oh my God, it just changed. I'm sorry. Like I, I, I honestly, I looked at this a few days ago, and we had like I guess I guess when the company just starting up, we had a free account, so we're able to process 5,000 images for free. But now it's already 99 dollars. But okay, but 99 dollars is still not a lot. So you can basically get the account for a month. Analyze 40,000 images, you know, and get out. Or for $100, you can, for $1,000, you can analyze, you know, uh, 1 million images, which is probably like all the photographs in all the museums in the world, right? So if you want to find out what really happened with photography, it will only cost you $1,000. Of course, you also have to have some good ideas and know what to do. So how does it work? Uh, right? So this is, you know, what we have. Okay. So the computer basically looks at the face, right? And analyzes your pixel values. And eventually, it gives you lots of information. Right? First of all, it says, I'm confident there is a face. You know, value is one. But what's interesting, right? when the computer gives you these answers, and that's also very important to understand about contemporary kind of computer-based knowledge, what I call soft epistemology, the knowledge is probabilistic. right? It's not certain. The computer gives you percentages. It says, well, I think the rate is white. I'm pretty sure, but I'm actually 97% sure. Uh, the age, I think, is uh, 25, right? The smile, I'm pretty sure it's one, right? Uh, so some values it says, I'm sure, some values it gives you probabilistic, right? Uh, value, 
And the thing about computer vision, if you want to use it like in your projects, it works very well if you give it this kind of perfect images, right? So here's a perfect face and a perfect background, there's nothing else. But if I start giving it more real life images, like what you said in Instagram, right, it may not work maybe as well. Uh, so here are just you know, some collection of just random Instagram images, actually, right, from our project. So we can just kind of try it out and see you know, if it's going to work or not. Okay, so let's just see. Okay, so that actually seems like it's okay. So, for example, it found two faces, but it missed this girl. You know? Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So, what about what about this guy, right? So, did, okay. I think it's Slava Zizek actually. Okay? So, obviously, he's not recognizable, right? Okay, so even a very simple thing, right? Which you know, which computer scientists have been working on for seventy years now, sixty years. Face recognition kind of works, but not perfectly, right? Which of course has huge implications for privacy. You know how America has one million people on a this kind of dangerous list, right? So if you go to an airport, maybe some of you, particularly if you have a you know, foreign foreign citizenship, you've been pulled out. There are children on this list. Obviously, most of these people are there because of errors, right? And now you can see why. Now you can see the dangers of our society switching to computers. Now, if you want to look, if you want to use computer to do for example, understand the content of the scene. Yeah, if you give it this perfect image of a beach, it says, I think it's a beach, 46% accuracy, but it says, I also think maybe it's a mountain, 7%, right? Okay, so well, you know, so, so how do you kind of use this, right? And again, if you start giving it some random images, we can just try. I mean, I don't, I'm not even sure what happens, right? So let's just give it some random Instagram image. Well, it's pretty good, there it is a food, 4.6%. But also things maybe it's a restaurant one percent, right? Uh, so this, you know, so because I'm kind of saying it because you know there are some people who have been looking, you know, seeing my work and work our lab and saying, lab, aren't you kind of this formalist? Why are you always, you know, why are you always uh, organizing images by these formal features like color, bright, and so on? I said, well, you know, I would love to do content, but it's sort of hard, right? It's sort of hard. Even the state of art software, you can see, it kind of makes mistakes very easy. Okay, well now what I kind of gave you is like. I can condense, you know, like a whole course in 10 minutes and introduce you to maybe very, very basics of you know, what a computer can do, how a computer analyzes images, and how we can use visualization then to use the results of this analysis. I will show you some projects. Okay. Um, so, um, so first, yeah, we spent three years applying these techniques to rather small image collections and actually a very kind of famous type of images because we wanted to make sure these techniques are going to work. So here's just one example. So uh, according to the best estimates, right, the impressionists, uh, you know, which is the artists which participate in, in the impressionist exhibitions, right, in Paris in the 1870s and 1880s, so about, I think, 13 people, 15 people, they painted about 13,000 pastels and paintings Obviously, there's not a single book where you can see it, right? So when you guys think about Impressionism, you think of, you know, Van Gogh flowers, or maybe you think of Monet, you know, sort of water we use, but you think of something, right? Maybe like this, you know, very really light, kind of happy, right? Instagram-y, right? Uh, kind of pre-Instagram, right? Uh, you know, kind of vulgar, right? right? I mean, it's a really vulgar art, right? That's why it's so popular, right? I mean, look at this. No, no, no. Anyway, okay, but, okay. so what we've done is, with my students, you know, we spent a couple of classes, you know, and we collected, you know, we tried to collect all the images of Impressionist paintings we could find online. So we didn't find all 13,000, but uh, we did find, you know, over six, about 6,000, which is 50%. And then we used the, you know, computer vision to automatically measure, right, which is to convert various properties of images into numbers, right? So in this case, there's maybe 200 numbers, which the computer extract from an image. So the computer looks at, for example, amounts of red, green, and blue. The computer looks at uh, line orientation. The computer looks at textures, right? And when you put it all in the algorithm, and we're using, if you're interested, uh, the, you know, the details of the algorithm we're using from 1901. It's, it's fundamental algorithm data science from 1901. It just shows you how much things progressed or not. It's called uh, principal component analysis. It's basically a workhorse of contemporary data science, right? So the idea is that we have a collection of objects. In this case, we have a collection of images. 
And we want to organize these images in such a way with the images which are similar are next to each other, and the images which are dissimilar are far away from each other, right? And we want to do this as perfectly as possible. But well, in reality, right, there is no perfect solution to this problem because the images can be similar in so many different ways. So it kind of depends on parameters you use. But this is you know, one of many, many possible outputs of such an algorithm. And you can see it's making lots of mistakes, right? So here's a blue image next to brown images. Yeah, but if you zoom out, it actually works pretty well, right? And what you realize is that, in fact, what people think of as impressionism, right, which have this you know, pretty kind of maybe slightly vulgar images, is maybe about 30 to 40% of what impression is produced. So this is what we started to find out when we applied these techniques to various canonical sets of artistic images. If you think that a particular artist like Van Gogh or a particular say, artistic movement like impressionism is about something, it's about X, it turns out that in fact it's only a small part of what people produced, but these images are disregarded, right? They're not written by historians, they're not in museums, mostly, right? They're not in blockbuster exhibitions. We can delete it from our history, right? So our history, so this is the whole thing. And you can see surprisingly, right, impressions have produced lots and lots of these very dark images, which in fact are very, very similar to what so our people in the 19th century were doing, right? So this is more typical of the art of the 19th century, and this is the outlier called impressionism. And by organizing images by visual familiarity, you kind of get a good sense of proportion between you know, these images, which are more famous, and these images which are not famous, right? So that's the real picture of impressionism. Yeah, sure, sure. So lots of my portraits. I mean, it's probably images we painted maybe in the early part of our career, right? Before we kind of discovered, you know, their brand. Um, yeah, maybe also Manet, right? But uh, but quite, it's just quite interesting how many of them are here, right? So this is, you know, this is another example of what the impressionists have produced, right? And they produced a lot of it. Okay, so that's one example. So now you can say, yeah, that's kind of fun, but can we maybe animate it to see how these things develop over time? Okay, so we created this animation. So this is uh, the same thing, but in this case, we're just using one artist. So we digitize all his images from a catalog resume, which he created between 1905 and 1917, right? just before he developed his kind of canonical kind of grand style, right? Uh, and they said, how can we use these computer techniques to imagine an artistic development, right? The artist is developing, he is searching for things, eventually he's going to arrive at his unique style, his unique visual language. Uh, but what is the space of the search, right? Is it something similar to biological evolution? You know, how biological, if you believe in biological evolution, and apparently 70% of Americans believe in both Darwinian evolution and 70% of Americans believe also in God. So I'm not quite sure how it works together, right? Uh, our life is full of contradictions. And if you look at what the site people had, it's like terrifying. Uh, so what we've done is we've done the same thing, right? We use this technique, you know, which is again the most basic technique of uh, data science principal component analysis. We extracted about 60 different features, which is numerical characteristics of images, you know, things like, like a texture, number of shapes, colors. And then we organized all these images again like, automatically about well, them organized these images, like all the images he painted between 1904, 1905, and 1970, right? 12 years, about 144 paintings. And then we simply animated this, right? So what, what you can see is that kind of going back from this final figure, the images are going to pop up in the same year as they painted, and then the year is going to appear in the upper left corner, and what you're going to see is a possible visualization, right? A suggested view of, in fact, how artist is developing and looking for his or her unique, let's say, visual language in the space of infinite possibilities, because every possible image you can paint, photograph, imagine, would be somewhere in the square, right? So let's see how it looks. Again, I want to point out this is not science, this is more like art, this is suggestive, so the idea is not to come up with like a new canonical interpretation of what happened to modern, but the idea is to basically enlarge your ideas and give us more ways to think about both present, our own photographic production, and also cultural history. Okay? So I'm going to run this. You get the kind of shape. So as you see, the year appears in the upper, uh, upper left corner. Okay. So very interesting. So let's do like a kind of close analysis, right? A kind of like a close reading of this process. Okay. 
So in the beginning, modern, in the beginning, I think, you know, he's basically stuck. You know how guys you become, want to become artists, right? You went to some high school, you have a slightly decapitated art teacher called you had talent, you know? Now you end up, you know, now your parents are thinking art. I don't mean it's me, I mean some like art school X, right? <laughs> art school X, right? And now you're like, okay, you're like, why do all my photographs look like uh, really bad Richard Prince, you know? Uh, or like Ava, Richard Avalon, right? Okay. Well, Mondrian was, you know, he was no genius either, right? He was basically a bad schoolboy, you know? So he's making all these paintings. And the thing is, if you look at the museum, you're also going to find that they're similar. But I think visualizing was a more structured way, where in fact, a measure of visual distance, a measure of visual difference between two images is translated into distance, I think it makes it more precise, right? So you can see, in fact, the images are very similar, right? They kind of this somewhat abstracted landscape. In fact, he's already kind of abstract, right? Which I didn't know that. So he was a good boy. He was a kind of boy genius, but you know, we didn't know that. And the colors are really similar, right? So this was in the old days, I mean, you know, early 20th century, when artists maybe would take 20, 30 years to mature. Now, of course, the situation is different, right? You make one good photo, next day you have a show, you know, in Greenpoint, I mean, and then the next day thrown out, and you basically, right, dragged out in the hospital. So, but, you know, so take some time, right? Because probably, if you know, if you do it, like, probably you'll never get beyond this, right? So don't you want to become Mondrian? Anyway. So, okay, so he's stuck, right? You know, 1905, 1906, 1907, like, oh my God, the guy's in his 40s already, you know, what's happening? So when is he going to break through, right? Now, you can see things become a little bit more interesting, right? The space becomes a little bit bigger, but it's still all in one place. And finally, oh my God, 1907, oh my God, boom, okay? So here's his breakthrough painting. But you know what happens? You know how in life you can't change overnight. So yesterday you were basically like a successful lawyer, and today you went to enroll as undergraduate to art school X and say I'm going to become a photographer, but you're still secretly taking photographs of like law books or something, right? Or you, you know, you had a relationship, it's over, and when you guys kind of do these hookups, and when you both feel bad in the morning, right? So, you know, I think artistic development is the same, right? I find that, you know, it's very difficult for me to wake up tomorrow and start writing about something very different or start making photographs in a very different style. So the moment he makes this new painting, he also starts going back. So for a while, he oscillates between what he was doing earlier and, his, and the new Mondrian. You see? He's kind of going back and forth. But as things de develop, right, he's more brave, he's exploring a larger and larger part of the space of possibilities. And uh, eventually, right, I mean, we didn't finish, uh, we didn't get to his most canonical images, but this is where we got to 1917. Now, of course, right, this is not precise. In fact, this is suggestive. You can also visualize the same information in millions of different ways. But I think it's interesting, right, because what you find out is that, right, as he develops his new images are further and further away from where he started, right? So the difference in, the, say, visual language and the use of visual parameters increases, right? So by the time we finished, he's like somewhere here, 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 very far from where he started. But I think it's also interesting to see that like, as he develops, like, right, he explores a larger set of possibilities. So let's say somewhere by 19 you know, or 12, he makes images which are here, all the way here, and also all the way here, right? Very, very different. So he's not developing a long single line to go from point A to point B, but in fact, he's kind of covering this larger, larger set of possibilities, and then a few years, a few years later, he's going to arrive at his you know, canonical brand style, you know, which will, for better for worse, will make him famous. So I think it's very suggestive, right? Very interesting way to look at the let's say, artistic, stylistic development. And of course, you can apply it not only to history of photography, individual photography, but you can also apply it to individual artworks. Okay, so now that I showed you some examples, right, of what you can do, let me show you sort of our recent, more recent projects, where in fact, you can apply these techniques, or even more simple techniques, to try to understand patterns in the kind of vernacular photography Right, the social media, visual social media data, specifically we focus on Instagram. Um, so I'll show you about five projects very briefly, which we did in the course of a year and a half. Now I'm trying to recover and write a book about it, because it was very fast. So for our first project, right, we basically said we're just going to take a first look. We don't know what's on Instagram, but we know it's not just selfies and kitties, it's probably a whole visual universe, which is probably as rich as Momo, maybe more. So I think our goal was both to understand larger patterns of what these photographs look like, 
but also try to combat right the popular opinion with social media is just trivial, with Instagram is just you know, for nobodies. You know. But you guys know, of course, it's not true, right? But people in the street don't know it. So we downloaded, it's basically me and, and one graduate student, so we, the whole project was done with laptops. So we downloaded 2.3 million Instagram photos from 13 global cities. And then we set out to kind of visualize these photos in different ways. Right? So the most simple way, Right? Again, in this case, we're not using any kind of complex, even basic techniques from data science. So we simply took all the photos, right, which we shared in the center of a particular city from a data set, and we simply visualized them, right? Again, in a very kind of obvious way. I mean, we're not obviously, we didn't invent this way. The photos are basically organized left to right, right, left to right, you know, top to bottom. I'm sorry, sorry, left to right. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, left to right. Basically, goes like this, actually in order of upload. So this is 53,000 photos from Tokyo, which we're taking over you know, a few consecutive days. Right? So you can, but you can also zoom in, so we built this interactive website. So you can zoom in, move around, and see the details. And uh, uh, what's interesting is that you get this kind of sense of what I would call kind of collective right? montage, collective you know, uh, city film. Right, you have contributions of probably 20, 25,000 users. Right, everybody is taking images of what they like, so people don't make some agreement. Okay, let's all go photograph, you know, you know, ramen, right? Or let's all go photograph, you know, this. It's basically spontaneous expression of our free will. But of course, we're not so free, right? We follow particular patterns, right? We get up in the morning and have coffee, you know. I mean, I'll check out Google Analytics, you know. That's what I do. You maybe maybe you maybe checking your Facebook Analytics or whatever. Right, when you go to school, etc., uh, etc. Et so what I find kind of interesting here, right, is that every day and every night, I mean, maybe it's a bit hard to see here, when we just actually download this image. So all visualizations were done as a principle. You can download them at the highest resolution, 50,000 pixels, make prints, you know, we don't charge you. It's all open source, uh, including our software. So I just downloaded this image so we can actually look at this at larger scale. Uh, so as you can see, there were kind of nice patterns, right? Day and night, but uh, it's not perfect because people are also sharing lots of light photographs during the night. But what's interesting, every day and every night is a bit different length, right? Because the length of the day and night is proportional to how many pe people, photographs people uploaded in a particular city in the day. So one day is longer, one day is shorter. So you don't get the perfect bar chart. You, in fact, you get this kind of subjective, objective, and kind of social city unconscious are being kind of visualized spontaneously out of all these photographs. So that's one thing we've done. Uh, and then the second thing we've done is we uh, made these 50,000 image samples from a number of cities, and we organized them, again, using these very basic visual characteristics, which the computer can extract from images. Uh, it's not hard to guess what we are. So in this case, the average brightness right, is, uh, controls how far the image is from the center, so very light, very really dark. And then the average uh, hue, Right? Yeah, but it's such a thing as average hue, average color, uh, which if you kind of add all the colors together, uh, it kind of works. Uh, controls the angle of the image, right? Uh, so from zero to 360. You know, and here you can see the very kind of broad uh, strokes, right? which part of the color spectrum uh, has been kind of filled in, right? And then what parts of the color spectrum is uh, missing. And I think there's one thing which is missing very, very, very clearly because this image is done with cities. So what is one color you don't see here? Green, right? So not much green here, right? Not much green here. Okay, this is Tokyo. Okay. Yeah, a little bit different, actually more red. Uh, right? right? In fact, more red, maybe more night activity, you know, always neon, not much green, right? Now, so here comes the interesting question, right? So here are the same as three visualizations. Right? And they show you patterns which are, on the one hand, very similar. On the other hand, there's a big difference, right? There's some difference. I mean, here is a whole gap, so particular colors are missing. Okay. It's a bump off, right? So these kind of images are missing. In fact, you don't have as much red. There's a little bit of green. And here you have something else. Now, of course, we can use statistics and statistical analysis and do statistical tests Right? If you want to kind of, let's say, scientifically make a statement, they were 
this image collections are in fact similar or different according to the colors. But I'm not sure how a statistical test actually will be meaningful to any of you in the room, including me, uh, because we also have common sets. Right? So here's the question, right? Do all this, do, do these visualizations tell us that in fact the combination of modern cities, which are becoming more similar, plus Instagram, which is the same app, right? The same interface given to everybody. You have these filters, which appear in the same order. Everybody takes the same pictures, which are square pictures, plus maybe some kind of visual influences. So do all these factors, right, which combine globalization, urbanization, software interfaces, uh, do we lead to a certain kind of monoculture, right, where people are taking the same images, or are these differences significant, right? Are these differences significant enough to say, in fact, people are actually taking different photographs in different cities? Yes, you can do statistical tests, but what do we care, right? And actually, I think there is not a clear answer, right? I think the answer really depends on our interpretation. Right? So, again, the point of this visualization, not necessarily to give you, you know, a clear answer, but in fact to give you maybe some more detailed ideas, but also to open the conversation. Uh, so, this was the first thing we moved on, and of course, you know, it's a very, very rough approach, right? We didn't really differentiate with images in terms of subject matter or different users. We only have a look at colors. So, then in the next project, at Southie City, we said now we're going to focus on particular type of images. So in this case, we said we're going to basically now try to compare apples and apples as opposed to just compare everything. Uh, so I had a larger team this time. All right. So it's about you know eight people, including some leading visualization designers, uh, data scientists, uh, art history, PhD candidates from King Graduate Center where I teach, make some undergraduate students, so a combination of data scientists, art historians, and then people like me who don't know really anything precisely, just in between, right? All the fields. Uh, so we decided, you know, so we decided to do project on what my team thought was an interesting idea, like selfies. So we decided to do it in August of 2013, and I've been really trying very hard to convince my team not to do it. Um, guys, this is so banal. Like, no, none of my academic friends are going to, you know, respect me. We said, left. We know what we're doing. Just sign the check. So we convinced me to do it, and of course we got like thousands of newspaper articles about it. The people like. I spent, you know, months and months answering interviewers' questions. Now, of course, I understand what the awful thing popular media is. You can notice the person ask us, well, how are you guys collecting the data? Did you actually check your results? Whatever I said, because I have PhD after my name, I just tried. So it's very interesting about popular media. So here we basically try to look at this, try to compare selfie photographs from six different cities. And again, to kind of maybe talk about the same question, which is, are we going to find more similarity, right? Are people kind of taking selfies in the same way, regardless of, let's say, you know, gender, ethnicity, age, or are we going to find enough cultural difference, right? Uh, so to what extent with Instagram, which I think leads to perhaps certain, you know, certain uniformity, right? For one thing, everybody takes the same picture, and then you're using a more mobile phone, which also limits to a few photographic kind of, right? Photographic design techniques, are we going to find more uniformity, or are we going to find that despite this uniformity may be imposed by the software and hardware interface, there's still enough of a cultural difference. So we have done a variety of different uh, visualizations. Uh, so here is, for example, we we'll kind of show you again how people can look at images. So here's selection images from different cities, uh, which are sorted you know, very, very kind of uh, just in one way by face orientation. And then we kind of also show you like how do we actually compete a look at the images so you can crop them? Okay. And then you can also rotate it, right? So it kind of, you can go from you know, the normal view to the computer view, uh, just to, of course, remind people that we have you know, bad, bad things like NSA and, uh, and in fact, you know, these techniques are also used for lots of evil purposes. Uh, in fact, right, face recognition that they show to be very dangerous because that doesn't work very well. So then uh, what we've done is we created these kind of graphs which basically looks like a normal histogram. We compare the cities by a couple of characteristics, right? So in this case, we kind of, it's a smile distribution, right? So amount of smile by gender by city, right? But instead of making like the typical graphs, we can make these graphs once again from images, right? So again, the idea was not to reduce individual differences into a summary, into the aggregate, right? Which is how statistics and, and graphs are typically used. 
But the idea is to create some kind of displays, graphical representations, which on the one hand allow you to see patterns, but still remind you that these patterns emerge out of individuals, right? So you can move around, you can see kind of all the individual histogram images, right? And then you can zoom out and see the patterns, right? And here, like little kind of so little findings were put, but you have to click on them, right? So, of course, you know, you see that Bangkok, people smile much more, right? Uh, so in Sao Paulo, you can also see there are more female than male selfies, right? Because females in the top, top area and males in the, the bottom area. In Moscow, you know, uh, we don't really smile, you know? I mean, now we smile even less, right, after what happened, but we really don't smile in 2013, right? Uh, so then uh, we kind of wanted to uh, be able, right, you know, we said, well, you know, if we want to leave a project on the level of visualizations, this is a little bit abstract. This is maybe more interesting to visualization designers or to visual artists. I mean, journalists are not going to write about it. So we wanted to create a larger window so that normal journalists who are not interested in visual culture can write about these projects, you know, more people can visit it, and then maybe more people can get into, you know, and look at these graphs. So what we have done is we have done this very conventional, right, on purpose, like few internet research type of findings. And again, the purpose is you know, use very familiar graph, right? So we say, oh, we only found a set of selfies. There are more female than male. And of course, that's what everybody wrote about, because this is kind of statistics that people expect, right? But again, for us, it was a kind of device to have a bit bigger window to catch kind of more visitors. I mean, hopefully some visitors would go in and actually look at what the project was really about, which is the interactive interface we built, where again, the experiment with combining representation of patterns, right, via these kind of graphs, and in fact, the representation of the actual media, which gives rise to this pattern, right? So here is a whole kind of collection. So we collected, I mean, it took like months and months, uh, because we wanted to collect data under the same condition. So eventually we got you know, 3,200 selfies, so 640 selfies from every city. So you can browse them. Browse them. And then here you can basically select these filters, and you can filter them, right, by different characteristics. And of course, you can now use the same interface for any image collection. For example, potentially you can put all the kind of photos from MoMA into the same thing, right? So we can, for example, select you know, all the female selfies, right, versus male selfies. And now, of course, we get a precise number, okay? We can also say, let me select all the, for example, selfies from New York, okay? And now, out of New York selfies, we're going to select people are pretty old, like after 30, right? Well, I mean, meaning Instagram old, right? So it's about, and not that, not, not actually that, not that bad. So it is all old people, but not that many, right? Uh, now, what's interesting is that, like, see, this is a kind of histogram, right? Which shows the overall distribution of ages in these photos. How do we get the ages? We put this in mechanical turk, we ask the people to guess the age, and we also use the same kind of face recognition software. The age was very similar, so software, except software always judges people to be younger, because many people want to sell it. So what's interesting, like if I basically select Banco, you see how we have a second graph which overlaps? So now we can see right away that the selfies from Banco tend to be younger than overall population, with the selfies from New York tend to be older. Right, so this is a uh, kind of combination of computer and humans, and all this other stuff is computer, right? So we use this face recognition software, which I showed you. At one point, it was still free, and we extracted, you know, 20 different parameters. So, for example, you can say, well, you know, uh, what about what about all the kind of faces which are extremely tilting to the to the right? Okay. So, oh, you seem to be females. How interesting, right? And, and most of them seem to be in Sao Paulo, right? So you can see how it works. And then you can, you can kind of, you can nest these filters, right? You can see now I'm going to select all the people who are like really, really happy, okay? And then like really old happy people, okay? <laughs> okay, so again, it's obviously not only interface, but this is the direction, right, in which I wanted to go since the top, the top left, right? To be able to create interactive interfaces which will allow us to explore, right? For people who don't have technical skills, any collection of images or video of any size, right, and be able to actually see the individual images, yet at the same time see patterns. Okay? Uh, I, I know I'm aware of time, but I should probably finish like two minutes, five minutes. Yeah, I will show, right? 
Okay, so very, very briefly, I'll just show you the morphics. Okay, so this is a project I've done, I've done also last year myself, mostly. So here we wanted to look at uh, a mo even a more local collection, collection Instagram images, even more filtering. So basically, uh, there was a revolution in Ukraine, you know, uh, Kiev, right? Ukraine is a country in a, which was part of the former Soviet Union, for those of you who don't know, the world was in the news a lot. So it was a revolution about a year ago, you know, where people occupied uh, the main square, and there uh, was lots of uh, confrontation with police, and then eventually, you know, uh, after a few days, the government ran away, and then the new government took place, and then immediately, a few days later, of course, Putin said, no, it's not good. We're going to attack, uh, we're going to attack crime here. So we've done this project uh, about this. We basically downloaded all Instagram photos, right, from uh, a kind of square situated around uh, the main kind of place where all the protests were going on. And they said, what can we tell about the city from its photographs, right? So as opposed to simply saying, how do people who are organizing a political revolt, right, or revolution are using social media, so how is everybody using social media in the city during this event? So what extent this event even registers? So we've done lots of things, you know, we analyze, you know, text, we look at combination of images and text, right, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to highlight a couple of things, right? One is, right, so this is, again, the same visualization that I've done earlier, in our political project. So the revolution kind of starts here, it really goes on the way here, and by this time you have new government. But what's interesting, right? You can't even find it, right? So the, the exceptional, right, is kind of drawn, right? It kind of disappears in the series everyday Instagram photos. So uh, so the project turned out to be not really about revolution, the project turned out to be about interplay between everyday, right? Because, you know, maybe there's a revolution happening right now on Wall Street. Maybe it was like a military pool, military in a putsch, but we don't even know, right? We're still taking our selfies, and then the exceptional. Uh, so uh, we, we, you know, we use different techniques to do it. We also commissioned a bunch of different essays from different people to write about it. So the project becomes a kind of platform where uh, quantitative analysis, visualization, exists with kind of critical essays by different people, you know, both uh, students and also kind of faculty in different universities. Uh, but uh, what I also want to show you is another method we try to kind of understand what inside these images, which is the computer clustering. Right? So, uh, so here we can again analyzing images in terms of very low level characteristics, you know, color and so on, and feeding them in the computer and asking the computer to automatically divide all these 14,000 images, in which we shared and keep during one week, into groups of similar images. So the computer divides all the images into 60 groups. Some which is complete garbage, but some actually work very well, right? So here's a group we found, which have images which have to be mostly city scenes with particular composition, right? Here, in fact, the images we also found, which are lots of kind of collages and text of the image, and here is one of many variations of selfie species, right? The particular selfie species. But the computer doesn't know it's a selfie. The computer just knows that there's something dark in the middle and something light around it. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that you can use these methods where the computer doesn't know anything about image content, but simply analyzing images by similarity in terms of like, you know, colors or, or pixel values or texture, you can actually find these kind of clusters of uh, similar images. And what you realize is that something relatively small, right, which is a collection of like 13,000 images, and the images which we share during the exceptional event, right, but if you just look at this, you know, uh, you organize images, you know, one by one in order where we shared, it looks like a complete Right, kind of crazy, super modernist, you know, kind of montage plus, right? You know, so here is, you know, the revolution, here is the events, here is somebody eye, you know, here is somebody selfie, here is the food, you know, here is products, right? And it, it's kind of possible to see what the patterns, right? I mean, how prevalent are selfies, how prevalent are, you know, the images of revolts, right? But uh, by using kind of computer analysis, we can actually find this island, right, of similarity, and uh, what it also means is that you know, if you deal with dozens or hundreds of photographs, you don't need computers, right? You can just use your human, human eyes. And if you want to make sense of photographs, you know, let's say created by millions and billions of people, maybe find most interesting you know, hot photographs on Instagram, you know, or you know, even just get a sense of like, like what happened in photography history, you kind of have to use computer methods because once you go into tens of thousands or millions of photographs, you know, but, but I can't really, really understand the patterns anymore. So finally, very briefly, I'll show you our latest project, which uh, Adam already mentioned. 
So it's currently installed uh, in your public library as installation, but we also try to make most of the stuff available online. So basically what it is is that with the, here we kind of zoomed in even more, right? So we kind of go from comparing 13 cities to uh, then looking at the selfies in six cities to then looking at the big part of the one city, and here we're actually looking at single streets. So we wanted to create a very kind of data dense presentation of a single street in New York, which is Broadway, right? So we tried to collect you know, various data which would fall within the Broadway corridor. Uh, so we have here 22 million taxi rides along Broadway in 2013. All the publicly shared Instagram images along Broadway from 2013 for six months, so that's 660,000. Twitter uh, images, uh, Foursquare, like 8 million Foursquare check ins, but also census data from your census, right? So what we're doing now is writing papers where, in fact, we're comparing patterns in social media. Right, Instagram and so on, to the characteristics of these neighborhoods in terms of you know uh, income, uh, ethnicity, and so on, uh, and we even be able to actually put the installation, well, we even be able to kind of turn installation to kind of app, although it doesn't work as well because you need to have very fast computer, very fast connection. I can see this is not, but probably if you go to Starbucks, it will work better. Uh, anyway. So, and, uh, and uh, we kind of made a reference to a project which inspired us, so basically I'm going to finish by going back to history of photography, or history of modern art. Uh, so this is a famous project by artist, California artist Edward, Edward Usher, from 1966, where he created this very long photo book, where he kind of mounted himself in a camera on a car, and was driving along Sunset, Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles, and just taking photographs of, you know, like every, you know, every X meters, and then put it in a book. Well, this is great, but this can use the state of our technology from 1966. It makes a certain statement about, let's say, banality or similarity of, of these buildings. But in fact, you know, besides these similar buildings, people are very different. People are very diverse, and uh, where acts, behaviors are very diverse, where images are very diverse. So, of course, what we're interested in is, in fact, explore you know, more of the diversity and variability in such patterns in New York. So, again, we work with a team. With a bunch of people, you know, we went through you know, lots of different sketches, trying to figure out how we can represent all this data. And eventually I said, okay, guys, we're going to make a project which will not have a single normal graph, and it also will allow you to represent the city without maps. Everybody uses maps. Fuck it, we're not going to use maps, right? And then we become famous. That's how you do it, right? Uh, everybody becomes photographer and takes photographs. You said, I'm becoming a famous photographer, I'll never take a single photograph. I have no idea how to do it, but that's a good plan, I think, right? <laughs> anyway, so here we're trying to visualize, here we're trying to visualize the data. You can see the household income, taxi drop-offs, taxi pickups, and then eventually we created this kind of a you know like set of layers which you just saw, right? Where you can animate, uh, where you can kind of uh, go for the installation. You can zoom in, you can pinch out, you know, pinch back, and you can come navigate for kind of city uh, building by building, or you can zoom out for the patterns. So that was another experiment, another attempt to figure out how to allow kind of seamless navigation of large, large image collections. I mean, we couldn't put all the Instagram images in installations, only 40,000, but that's still a lot. But also somehow make you think about the invisible patterns, right? The invisible patterns of, you know, how many pretty images people put in a particular location. That's where household income. So basically, I think to try to, try to work on what I think is perhaps one of the most essential cultural and artistic problem of our time, which is how to navigate between our familiar world of visible appearances, which we can capture in beautiful photographs, and the new world of big and dangerous data. Thank you so much. So in most of our projects, right, in fact, we don't use this kind of high-level computer analysis uh, precisely because it's actually maybe too imprecise. Uh, so in fact, right, that's why I would say until recently, most of our projects, you know, we just uh, visualize things based on very simple things, which in fact are reliable, right? Things like color characteristics, texture characteristics, and so on. Uh, now, when we uh, did this project, right, uh, the selfies project, where in fact we have used you know, computer vision, we can look at the results, and we actually find that in many cases the results were actually very good, and in some cases were awful, 
the media decided to we had talked about we decided to leave, to leave it in it's a way to actually remind people that in fact you know these techniques are now becoming weak excuses that I tried to mention in the beginning and these techniques actually make errors so to me this is not maybe something I want to hide but in fact it's something I want to actually make visible and discuss right but I also want to say I mean I think that uh, the way our society uses these computer techniques, right, is ultimately this analysis is reduced to a number. Is there a face in the photo? How many faces? Does this face belong to the terrorist database? In our case, as you can see, you know, we are, we are uh, kind of actually not really showing you like any, like, we can show you average statistics, but that's about it. But mostly we show you like, the whole image collections, and then you yourself can see patterns, right? So the idea is, again, go to, uh, use computers and give us correct or incorrect answer, which will be a number, but in fact show you all the visual information in such a way that you can see patterns and you can also see variability and kind of diversity of uh, these images. I also didn't mention that we also use the kind of hack in the Google Street View, so what we're also seeing is a kind of Google Street View of you know, the whole, if you can kind of imagine if you take a, like, a car all throughout the roadways, so you can see how after a while you get much more sky, right? So yeah, we can measure it, we can give you a number, but I think what's interesting is that, of course, it's not perfect, right? The reality is not perfect. So I think our whole enterprise is basically trying to like, recover from modernity, trying to uncover from the 19th, 20th century world, which was about statistics, which was about reducing very really complex things like society to small numbers, right? The way Marx reduces society to, like, to classes. Well, you know, it doesn't work like this. Method for beauty. Let's see. You know, I haven't. Let's see. We haven't used it. But let's just see what. Let's see what we have here. Uh, oh yeah, I see beauty point ninety nine eighty seven. You know, the thing is, we the thing, right? Uh, we haven't used this. We only used sort of some more like let's say objective parameters, right? For example, like face orientation, right? Roll, etc., etc. We have no idea, right, how the algorithm works. And of course, we're not going to let you know because there's some other company will copy it, right? And that's, I think, another kind of danger uh, of the systems because they're kind of black boxes. So we give you results, right? So let's say there's a system which may you know, give you a number about how beautiful or how personable you are. And then, let's say, based on this number, you'll be hired or not. And people hire but have no idea actually how where the number came from, right? Uh, I mean, but and I think it's actually the only time we use like a system about you know, which we don't know how, how it works because we have tried to use open source code, it work as well. But normally, you know, we write our own code and basically everything we do, we know how it works, right? But in this case, we use something where actually we don't know how it works. Yeah. Nobody has written about it yet, as far as I know. So I don't have a name for it, but maybe we can call it something like computational media or even cultural analytics. So basically, a significant number right, of cultural interfaces right, that the companies put up for us to interact with culture depend on computational analysis of massive amounts of media. Right? So while we're using some of the same techniques as a way to do a kind of our history or archaeology of the present, Right? I think you want to be curious, and I think you want to learn about these techniques, just because you know, if you want to be a literate photographer, right, or a literate artist in 2015, you should know how mass visual culture works. You should know how culture industry works. And I'm telling you, not all of it, but to a significant extent, it works on, not just on code, right, not just on you know, MySQL, you know, Python, so on. It works on the particular techniques of analyzing Massive amounts of media. I mean, think about Google search. I mean, how does Google search works? Well, Google sends robots. You know, they go online. They travel from one web page to another page. There's maybe about 14 to 15 billion web pages today, according to best estimates. It extracts all the content right from every web page. It analyzes all this content, right? Whatever it is, you know, breaks it down. If it's images, it's also images, puts it in database indexes, and then when you search for something, it's going to, it will return pages which you think are most relevant, or in the case of images, people building the future. 
Uh, in addition to being a former Guggenheim Fellow, he has also received grants from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, for those of you who want a closer look at some of his work, I would encourage you to check out his website, which I'm sure he's going to show today, uh, which he's worked on uh, called On Broadway, and also to check out the Public Eye uh, Photography Show at the New York Public Library, which is up now, and I think does it run until next March? Until January, okay which is a fabulous show and highly encourage you to check it out. So it is a great honor to have Lev here and uh, this will be a fantastic lecture. Well, thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you guys so much for organizing this. And uh, uh, we hope that maybe not maybe my last engagement, you know, we're talking maybe about doing some workshop with some students. So hopefully you still like me after this first date. Now, I know you got some students who were, were actually required to come here, so please don't hate me after this, okay? And if you hate me, I'll buy you beer. Um, so today I'll be talking and actually showing you uh, a range of projects we have done in our lab, uh, which is trying to look at massive image collections using techniques of data visualization and also computer vision. Uh, and I'm specifically going to focus on the projects where we look at photography, the video to the image of the video. So search, which is now our interface to information, as opposed to, let's say, library catalog, uh, depends on massive processing of cultural content, such as web pages and other stuff online. Right? Recommendations, right? So if I go to Amazon and Netflix, you know, they're going to recommend me some movies to see, or some books to buy, or you know, uh, baby diapers, or maybe some super expensive lens for my camera, whatever, right? But how does Amazon know what I like? Well, it looks at what I'm looking at, it looks at what I'm buying. It compares me to the same buying histories of billions of billions of our user sessions. And then, again, does calculation. So in this case, the calculations are done not on the actual media, such as photograph of the pages, but the calculations are done on my cultural preferences, right, my buying history. Uh, we go to maybe one of the more popular kind of newer news website, such as you know, Meshable.com. So I was talking to a guy who is very chief data scientist, right? and he says that, so we build an algorithm, right, which basically recommends to journalists every morning what we should write about, you know, based on processing you know, billions of numbers, you know, what people looked at before, what people looked at last year. But I think what's even more amazing, like when he, when he told this, I was just totally shocked. So we have an algorithm which is, uh, in real time, adjusts the position of articles on the page. So it analyzes the data, right, of people kind of visiting its website, you know, using some old data, uh, and it basically uses this to automatically Hi, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, and it's especially nice to see some non-MFA photo people who have joined us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adam Bell, and I'm the academic advisor and faculty member in the MFA photo department. And we are very excited to have Lev Manovich here to give a talk. And as a bit of history, I'm especially excited because I remember when I was a student not too long ago, or actually maybe a little bit long ago, back starting in my first year in 2001, I remember buying and reading Lev Manovich's uh, famous book, uh, The Language of New Media, and being amazed by it and thinking it was this brilliant book. So it's really great to have him here now. Um, for those of you who don't know a little bit about Lev, I'm going to do a sort of abbreviated bio, which I've taken from his uh, website, uh, which I'll just go through quickly here. Uh, Lev Manovich is an artist, computer animator, designer, and programmer as well as an author of numerous books, including his most recent, which is Software Takes Command, Soft Cinema, Navigating the Database, and The Language of New Media. He is currently a professor at the Graduate Center of CUNY and the director of the Software Studies Initiative that works on the analysis and visualization of big cultural data. In 2013, he appeared on the list of 25 people shaping the future of design, and in 2004, he was included in the list of the 50 most interesting uh, via Instagram. But before I show these projects, you know, I want to make a kind of more general statement. 
So, you know, I think last year, you know, President Obama, right, said that if you be literate in our society, you have to know how to program. I mean, now I'm sure you have other, you know, people you maybe admire more or respect more. But, you know, when the President of the uh, you know, United States says everybody has to program, I mean, I was very happy to hear that. Because those of us who have been involved in digital art, and I've, I've been involved for about 30 years, of course, we're dreaming about the moment where people will actually say, hey, it's not enough for me to know how to you know, press you know, a button on my Leica or you know, uh, make a PowerPoint. I should also know something about the code, because the code is to a modern society, is what I would say electric engine, uh, you know, the, the trains, uh, and our kind of technological forces were to industrial society, right? Everything runs on code. Well, we know that. Even President Obama knows that, right? So that's not a big news. But what you guys may not have realized is that, in fact, if you think about visual culture, right, in the history of media, it's the 19th century, you know, we've got photography, we've got Fox, we've got television invented in 1870, and then, of course, all these things become really big in the 20th century, you know, radio, again, television, video, internet, and so on. Right? But I think that maybe five to 10 years ago, in fact, our society has entered a new stage, or let's say our media culture have entered a new stage, and amazingly, 